Good afternoon, and thank you for attending our webinar, Tips for Picking a Belt Scale Provider for New Installations, Upgrades, and Retrofits. I am Jim Haldeman, Business Development Manager at the Lessman Instrument Company for Instrumentation and the host of today's webinar. We are joined today by our presenter, John Dronette. John has more than 30 years experience with Wang Technologies, working at Miltronics and now Siemens in capacities from field service and application engineering to his current role as product manager for Wang Technologies and process protection. John has application experience in the power, mining, cement, food and beverage, paper and metals industries. If you have questions, please enter them into the question pane below and I will ask them on your behalf. The webinar will be recorded for posting on our website. John, please begin your presentation. Thank you, Jim, and thanks everyone for attending today. As Jim said, my name's John Dronet. I'm a product manager for Siemens Weighing Products. And today, I wanted to talk about some of the key criteria in selecting a bell scale and how the Siemens features apply uh, to those criteria. We'll start out talking with uh, about the Siemens weighing portfolio overall, just a very brief, brief overview. Uh, we'll look at bell scale principle of operation, then a more detailed view of the Siemens bell scale portfolio, and then we'll get into some of these key criteria, and then we'll look at a couple of bell scale applications. These are the, the Siemens weighing products that we offer. We have load cells, and these could be used on anything from bin weighing systems, platform scales, check weighers, things along those lines. We have uh, bell scales that measure material that, as it's transported by a conveyor belt. And we'll talk more about that going into the presentation. We have a line of solids flow meters that can measure powders or granules as they flow through a pipe. And we have a line of wave feeders that are designed to control the feed rate of bulk solids as they move through the process. And of course, we have weighing electronics for all of these different applications. Our electronics can either be module based, uh, where they can either operate standalone or plug directly into the control system, or they can be weighing terminals where they operate completely independent of the control system and just feed it information. So this is a typical uh, industrial conveyor. You can see there's a, a rubber belt. Usually it's rubber. It's, it can be made out of other things, but most of the time they're rubber, and that supports the product as it's moved on the conveyor. Well, this rubber belt is supported by rollers we call idlers, and there are two rails that run the entire length of the conveyor, one on each side, and those are called conveyor stringers, and the idlers are bolted down to those stringers. So to install a belt scale, you would remove one of the idlers, you would bolt the belt scale in where the idler was, and then clamp the idler on top of the scale. So looking, so looking at, at how this would work, a, a belt scale works just like any other scale. Like with a platform scale or a bathroom scale even, you know, you put a weight on it and it tells you how much it weighs. Well, bell scales work the same way. You, you put a weight on it and it tells you how much it weighs, but there's a twist with a bell scale in that you're not measuring individual pieces, you're measuring bulk material and you're measuring it being put on and off the scale uh, using a conveyor belt. So you're not just weighing an individual piece, but you're weighing a length of material. So in bell scale terms, the weight measurement, or we call it the load, is gonna be in pounds per foot. We'll measure the speed of the belt. Typically that's in feet per minute. Well, if you multiply pounds per foot times feet per minute, you can see that the feet cancel out and you end up with pounds per minute. And of course, that can be converted to whatever units you want. Most often it'll be in tons per hour with the bell scale. Now this math all takes place inside the bell scale electronics. Uh, we call that a bell scale integrator. And a bell scale integrator will typically provide four different outputs. You'll have 
a rate output, which is how many tons per hour are moving across that scale at this moment. And then it'll have an accumulated total. That's how many tons have run across the scale since the totalizer was last reset. You can kind of think about it like the speedometer on your car. If you look at the speedometer on your car, it'll say, I'm going 50 miles an hour. That's your rate. But it'll also have the odometer that tells you you've traveled 500 miles and that's your totalizer. So it's similar to the speedometer on your car, except that it's in mass measurements or mass units rather than units of length. It'll also, the integrator will also show the primary measurements, which you remember would be the load, how many pounds per foot are on the scale, and the speed, which is how many feet per minute the belt is moving. This is our, our belt scale offering. The ones kind of down the center of the slide there are the ones I would consider for typical conveyors. We have the MUS, which is a half to 1% scale. We have the MSI, which is a half percent scale. And we have the MMI. Now the MMI can be configured with two idlers like I show here, and that would be a quarter percent scale. And that scale is NTEP certified. For those of you not familiar with NTEP, NTEP stands for National Type Evaluation Program. And it's a program administrated through the National Conference of Weights and Measures that certify this scale is capable of meeting the accuracy that, that's required or specified. This certification is required for any scale that's gonna be used for custody transfer. In other words, if they're gonna charge the customer based on the weight output of that scale, it has to be NTEP certified for the US market, and the US market is required. So for example, if you go to the grocery store and you buy produce and you take it to the cash register and they put it on the scale or you put it on the scale nowadays, and it tells you, uh, you know, you have this much weight and it's gonna cost you this much, that scale has to be NTEP certified. Somewhere on there, there's an NTEP sticker. Now, with cash register scales, it's typically on the back, so you probably can't see it. Uh, but where you can see it is on gas pumps. If you look at a gas pump, you typically next to how many gallons have been transferred will be an NTEP logo. So they'll have an NTEP sticker on, on that gas pump. Typically it's visible. Now the scales in, oh, uh, with the MMI, we can also configure it with three idlers. Uh, and if we configure it with three idlers, then it's an 8% scale. Now the scales in the upper left, these would be for uh, non-standard uh, applications. The WD-600 and the MLC are specially designed for very light loading applications. This would be things like potato chips or breakfast cereal. Uh, tobacco leaves is another thing we've used it for. We use it a lot for, we use them a lot for produce at the, at the farm. Uh, where they're measuring things like bell peppers or tomatoes and things like that coming out of the farm. And then the MCS is specially designed for conveyors that have a very low profile. So the carrying side of the belt and the return side of the belt are very close together. And this is typically found in, uh, in the aggregate industry on mobile crushers is most often where we see uh, low profile conveyors. Looking at our portfolio of belt scale integrators, we have three models. We have uh, the WT241, uh, and this is more of a basic integrator, but it has some nice features, like it's a stainless steel enclosure. It has a, a nice flat panel display uh, for a touch screen for uh, easy configuration. It has a uh, Modbus RTU on board. There's also a Modbus TCPIP port, uh, but we say that's for diagnostics only because it's the port that's used to connect to the HMI. So if you wanted to use that port for diagnostics, you can disconnect the HMI, go in, uh, hook your laptop up, uh, work from it from there, and then uh, reconnect your HMI. It also has an analog output for typically used for rate. And then there are four uh, digital outputs and four digital inputs. 
our most popular integrator is the BW500L. Uh, it comes with all the standard features of the bell scale, like there's one analog output, two totalizer outputs, that's standard. We can also do an option card that'll give you two more analog outputs and two more uh, analog or two analog inputs. Uh, there are three programmable relays, so those could be used for alarms. It has bus communications. It comes standard with Modbus ASCII and Modbus RTU, but there are option cards available for Profibus DP, Profinet, DeviceNet, Ethernet IP, and TCP, Modbus TCP IP. So it covers all of the major protocols. Now we also have the full featured BW500, which has everything the 500L has, uh, but it also has two PID control loops built into it. So if you were gonna use this on a wave feeder where you needed a PID loop to control the speed of the, the feeder, uh, you could use the full featured BW500 for that. It's also the model that's INTEP approved. The reason the full featured BW500 is approved by INTEP is because the BW500L only has two load cell inputs. And if you remember the bell scale that's certified as a dual idler scale, uh, we use two load cells per idler, so that would require four load cell inputs. So to do an INTEP certified scale or to have a quarter percent scale, you have to move to the full feature BW500. It has a built-in batch controller, two additional programmable relays, so a total of five. It can do differential speed detection. So if you mounted a speed sensor on the driven pulley, and a speed sensor on a non-driven pulley, it would watch for a difference between those two speeds and give you an alarm uh, indicating that you may have belt slip. The, the full-featured BW500 can handle up to six load cells. It can also do incline compensation. Now with incline compensation, if it's a fixed incline, you really don't need incline compensation where in because that's normally taken out in the calibration process where you would need incline compensation if you had an incline that changed for example let's say you had a stack or conveyor where you were putting material onto a pile um, but maybe the material was a little bit fragile so you didn't want to drop it too far so you would have a, a variable incline conveyor it would start out at say two degrees um, as the pile got larger the conveyor the discharge of the conveyor would move up, uh, making the incline angle steeper up to maybe say 15, 18 degrees. Um, in that situation where that incline changes, you have to have incline compensation and you would have to go to the full featured PW500. And then we also have moisture input. So if you wanted to have a moisture sampler on there and subtract out the moisture from the accumulated total, uh, you could do that using uh, the full featured BW500. We have a, a couple of different designs of speed sensors. Uh, we have what they call trailing arm speed sensors, which would be uh, like the RBSS and the TASS. Uh, they have a wheel that rides on the return side of the belt. And we measure the speed that that wheel is turning and calculate the speed of the belt based on that. We also have shaft mounted speed sensors like the WS300. And the way I typically boil that down to customers is the trailing arm speed sensors are gonna be easier to install. But the shaft mounted speed sensors are going to, one, be uh, require a little less maintenance because there's fewer moving parts. And they'll also tend to be a little more accurate because with the trailing arm speed sensor, there's an opportunity for that wheel to slip on the return belt, whereas you don't have that opportunity with a shaft mounted speed sensor. So the way I boil it down to customers is uh, for higher accuracy, less maintenance, go shaft mounted. If you want uh, an easier installation, then go trailing arm. Generally speaking, the way customers will group these different products together is for process scales where they don't need a lot of accuracy, they'll typically go MUS with an RBSS and a BW500L. For process scales where they need a little more accuracy or perhaps an inventory scale that's not a real critical inventory, 
they would use an MSI with a WS300 and a BW500L. And then for high accuracy applications, such as um, inventory measurements, custody transfer, that intel I was talking about, um, or if they're using it as a productivity measurement, they would go with the MMI, with the WS300, and a, beta, a full featured BW500. We also have a calibration weightlifter. So to calibrate a belt scale, you have to place a, a, a calibration weight on the scale. And to do that, you have to reach between the, the uh, belt strands, the carrying side of the belt and the return side of the belt. In order to do that safely, the conveyor should be locked and tagged out. Um, so we developed this calibration weightlifter. So once it's installed, you can use the crank to place the weights on the scale, turn the crank the other way to lift the weights off of the scale. So you could do this completely outside of the belt line so you would not have to cross between the carrying side and the return side of the belt so the conveyor wouldn't have to be um, locked out tagged out to do a calibration so it makes the calibration a little easier it also um, provides a convenient place to store the calibration weights uh, sometimes you know calibration weights get misplaced and things like this with that the calibration weight is always stored between uh, between the belt strands. And we have a lot of other accessories for belt scales. You know, when I was talking on the last slide, we talked about doing the calibration with calibration weights. Uh, some customers prefer to use calibration chains, and we can supply calibration chains as well. Uh, with the chain, basically you have a test chain reel that mounts up above the conveyor. Uh, to do a calibration, you would winch the um, the calibration chain out onto the belt, you cable it in place, start the belt running, do your calibration, and when you're done, you would wind the uh, calibration chain back up in the test chain reel that I show there at the bottom. We have uh, remote displays. Uh, we have bend pulleys. So with a bend pulley, if you're using a shaft-mounted speed sensor, uh, to install a shaft-mounted speed sensor, you have to drill a hole in one of the bend pulleys on the conveyor. Well, if you didn't want to do that, a little bit easier way to go is you could use one of our bend pulleys. They come pre-drilled to accept our speed sensor. And so it makes the, the installation of a shaft-driven speed sensor a little, easy, a little easier. And then we have accessories that are required for an in-tub scale. Um, one requirement is you have to have some type of logging uh, so we can provide chart recorders. You don't have to use ours, but we can provide them if you need them. Uh, it also requires that you have either a ticket printer or a tape printer. Uh, we, we can supply that as well. And it also requires that you have either audible or visual alarms when you're running outside of the calibrated range of the scale. And we can provide a, 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 a box with visual alarms on it uh, to meet that requirement. So now let's get into some of those key criteria I was talking about. You know, one of the things people always want is low maintenance, and this increases the availability of the conveyor uh, to do any kind of maintenance on a belt scale or any kind of troubleshooting. You can't have material running on the belt. So the conveyor is basically not available during uh, maintenance, maintenance processes. Uh, it also reducing maintenance also reduces the demand on the maintenance staff. So this is kind of an important criteria. Uh, accuracy and this eliminates the need or reduces the need to reprocess. So if you're using the scale to feed a machine at a certain flow rate, let's say, um, you know that machine's designed to be fed at say, you know, five tons an hour, let's say. Well, if you're feeding it at six tons an hour, it'll probably still be running, but you may start experiencing spillage. You may also uh, may not process the material correctly, so it's going to have to go back and be reprocessed. So having a, the more accuracy in the scale uh, reduces the need to reprocess processing um, product. If it's an inventory scale, yeah. Obviously, it would improve inventory accuracy. The more accurate the scale, the more accurate the inventory is going to be. Uh, customers always also look for uh, ease of installation. And this contributes to a lower to total cost of ownership. 
So if the scale, if the conveyor has to be down longer to do an installation, that's going to contribute to the overall uh, total cost of ownership because you know you're not producing material, so that figures into that that factor. Uh, it reduces downtime uh, for for the installation process. Something that's become more important lately is interchangeability, uh, and there's two aspects of that. In other words, can you can you mix and match parts between the two different two different manufacturers? Uh, also, can our scale meet all of the uh, applications of uh, the other brand? So the reason this has become more important is we've had a competitor that exited the market. They retired their entire belt scale product line uh, last year. And customers aren't wanting to go in and just do a mass replacement. They're wanting to kind of go as the, the need arises. And this interchangeability will contribute to the ability to do that. And the last thing is support. You know, who do you call when you when you need help and, and how much help are you gonna get? So we're gonna take a look at each of these in a little more detail, but before we do that, I wanna talk about a little more about how bell scales work. Any bell scale is gonna have two forces acting on it. You're gonna have the force of the material pushing down, that's the one you're interested in, but you also have a force created as the belt is pulled across that scale idler. To have a high accuracy scale, and when I'm talking high accuracy, I'm talking a half percent or better, you have to mechanically remove that horizontal force component. Now we do that in our load cells. This is the load cell from an MSI and an MMI. If you apply a load here, uh, this front post will deflect down slightly usually less than a millimeter. And that's what gives you your deflection for your strain gauges. But if you apply a horizontal force, that horizontal force just translates through these horizontal beams and into the post in the back. But the post in the back is, is a big, thick post, so you can't get any deflection in it. So there's no deflection in the strain gauges as a result of that horizontal force. So now let's look at how other scale manufacturers will do the same thing. Just like with our with any conveyor, they're going to have those two forces acting on it. You'll have the force of the material pushing down. Uh, with this type of scale, that force will translate through the beams that support the idler and down into the load cell in the front. So that's where you get the deflection for your weight measurement. If you have a horizontal force, the horizontal force just pulls against these pivots. So there's no deflection in the load cell as a result of that horizontal force. So we're both doing the same thing, we're just doing it different ways. So now going back to that key criteria, uh, we talked about low maintenance. Uh, this increases the availability and it reduces the demand on the maintenance staff. If you look at the two designs, the MSI uses a direct suspension system. So the idler is directly coupled to the load cell. With the other design, they use a pivot and lever system to couple the idler to the load cell. Well, these pivots are maintenance points. If the pivots aren't maintained properly, the scales start to get hysteresis, and that will affect the accuracy of the scale. You know, I've been doing this for quite some time, and back when I first started, um, we had a pivot scale. This was back in probably the late 80s. And uh, I was out, I was a field service engineer at the time. I was out working on one. This was in, um, it was in Utah, and it was cold and snowy, and I didn't really want to be there. The, the scale, I couldn't get the scale to repeat. The scale was down in a tunnel, and I was down in the tunnel just kind of staring at the scale, trying to figure out what my next step was. And, you know, I was young and impatient, and just out of sheer frustration, I, I kind of hopped up on the handrail down in the tunnel, and I took my steel toe boot, and I kicked that scale as hard as I could. Now, I don't recommend that as a troubleshooting method for belt scales. In fact, I would discourage it. 
But in that particular case, it worked. And the reason it worked was because some piece of ice or dirt or something had gotten wedged into that pivot and it was causing hysteresis in the scale. And by giving it that little jolt, it was able to clear whatever it was. So I rebuilt, rebuilt the pivots and the scale performed beautifully after that. So by reducing, by eliminating the pivot, we've reduced it, the maintenance required. We've eliminated a maintenance point. The other thing to consider about the MSI design, if you look at all of the structural steel that's up above the load cell, and that's the stuff that's gonna affect your zero performance, we've turned all that steel vertically. So there's very little surface area for material to build up on those surfaces. When you have a pivot system, these pivots are, or um or structural steel beams or structural steel levers that um that were wide enough to accumulate buildup which can affect your zero so um so we've had far fewer areas for material to build up so by turning everything vertical it reduces the amount of, of buildup that you'll have in the scale so now let's talk about accuracy which can reduce the need to reprocess material um, and it can improve inventory accuracy. When you look at the design of the MSI, as I said earlier, the, the idler is directly coupled to the load cell. So 100% of the load that's applied to that idler is gonna transfer down into the load cell. When you look at a pivot scale design, you have the pivot back here and you have, you have the pivot on one end and you have the load cell on the other and the idler mount is somewhere on the lever. Well, if you think about that, part of that load is gonna be supported by the pivot and part of that load is gonna be supported by the load cell. And that can be expressed as the ratio of the distance from the pivot to the load divided by the distance from the pivot to the load cell. So let's say you had a lever that was three feet long. You located the idler six inches from the load cell so if you divide 2.5 by 3, um, that's about 0.83. So about 83% of the load that's applied to the idler will actually make it to the load cell. Whereas with a, a direct coupling like ours or a direct suspension system, 100% uh, of that load is applied into the load cell. The other thing to think about with uh, with the direct suspension system is speed of response. And speed of response is really critical in a bell scale application. If you think about it, you're moving material across that scale at whatever the bell speed is. So if you're running two, 300 feet a minute, sometimes we've done them as much as 600 feet a minute, um, that scale has to respond fast enough to see those changes in weight measurement. We did some testing uh, we supported a lever on one end with a knife pivot, and we supported on the other end by the load cell, and we dropped the weight onto the onto the load cell, directly above the load cell. Um, we found that it took about 20 milliseconds for that weight limit to stabilize, or that weight load, to, uh, the weight to stabilize. Then we removed the lever and dropped the weight directly onto the load cell, and it took about 10 milliseconds. So reducing the amount of mass above the load cell uh, can increase the response time of the, of the scale. So we have a faster response and we have a more sensitive scale. And this is what allows us to be the only load cell man or the only bell scale manufacturer that can intep certify a scale with only two idlers. So now let's talk about ease of installation. And when I talk about uh, ease of installation, it lowers your total overall cost of ownership. It also reduces your downtime to do the installation. If you look at the design of our MSI, uh, it's gonna be the width of whatever the conveyor is, but it's only gonna be about a foot long. When you have a pivot and lever system, it's also gonna be the width of the conveyor but it's going to be the length of the levers and the pivot system and all of that. So you have all of this additional steel, you have the levers and the pivots and all of that. And then you also have to have the framing to accept all that. 
And this is all one big piece. So this thing can get fairly large, fairly heavy, fairly quickly. Um, I remember I personally installed uh, a dual idler uh, MMI on a conveyor that was 72 inches wide with me and one other person. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you, it was heavy, but we were able to set it into place, bolt it down, and then put the idler on top of it. Um, to install a dual idler pivot scale in a conveyor that's maybe 48 inches wide, would require some kind of heavy lifting equipment. So what you would have to do is cut the belt, you would lift it into place with some kind of heavy lifting equipment, uh, set it into place, pull your belt ends back together and re-splice your belt. And that's if you have space for heavy lifting equipment. If you're down in a tunnel, what you have to do is install it outside of the tunnel and then remove all of the idlers to where you want the scale to be and then slide it down and then put your idlers back. So uh, this can be a much more uh, difficult installation. So by removing this pivot and lever system, uh, it allows a much more, a much easier uh, installation because of significant reduction in the weight of the scale. Now we'll talk about interchangeability a little bit. And this just allows for a smooth transition if you're having to transition away from uh, the company that's decided to exit the market. If you have another belt scale installed, our BW500 will work with any belt scale available on the market today. Um, we would recommend that you replace the speed sensor because there are a lot of different speed sensor outputs and you just wanna make sure that you have one that's compatible with our BW500. Now, if you wanted to go the other way and use our MSI or our MMI with someone else's electronics, technically it would work, um, but I, I, I don't necessarily recommend that. And the reason is for a couple of things. One is, is if you have a company that's no longer selling a product and you have their Waybridge in and um, they're not going to be supporting their products anymore. So um, the support is going to have to come from whoever makes the electronics because they're going to know where the different values are programmed and, and how they should be programmed and things like that. So you're not going to be able to get support for the scale. And then the other thing is, is the, the scale itself, the Waybridge, that's the most difficult part to install. So if you're gonna replace that, you might as well go ahead and replace the electronics as well. The other aspect of interchangeability that I mentioned earlier is, is can we fit into all of the different applications? So if you look at belt scale technologies, most belt scale manufacturers will have a 1% scale. Uh, most of them will have a 2% scale. Uh, some manufacturers will have a quarter percent scale. Uh, very few customers or bell scale manufacturers will have an INTEP certified. There's only very few uh, bell scale manufacturers that have this certification. And uh, there are very few bell scale manufacturers that have a scale capable of 8%. We can meet the requirements of all of these different applications. As I mentioned earlier, we have the MUS for 1% applications. We have the MSI for half percent applications. For quarter percent, we have the MMI2, and that can be NTEP certified, so that covers both of those categories. And then we have the three idler MMI uh, for the eight percent application. So whatever accuracy specification you're working with now, uh, we can meet that with our portfolio. And finally, we'll talk about service. And this is an important criteria because what happens when, when things don't go well and you need some help? Uh, we have a 24-hour tech support line, and that's the phone number. It operates, you can call them on Christmas morning if you wanted to. Um, it may take them a, a little bit of time to get back to you, but they'll return your call. Uh, and these are people that have been out and worked on the belt skills in the field. They're not typing your question into a computer and telling you what the computer says to respond with. Uh, they're actually answering your question and thinking about your problem and helping you solve it. 
We have field service. We have three field service uh, locations, one in Chicago, one in New York, and one in Charlotte. If you wanted to schedule field service, you could do that through your local Siemens representative. And then we also work with some independent uh, service contractors kind of scattered about the US. Um, if you're if you're not close to one of those areas, we could probably do something like that. If you're more of a, a self-help person, like to find out things on your own, uh, we have two websites. We have Siemens.com slash SIOS. Uh, and that SIOS stands for Siemens Industry Online Support. Uh, we also have our Wayne webpage, which is usa.siemens.com slash Wayne. Uh, from these websites, you can get specification sheets. Um, there are manuals. There's a frequently asked questions section. Uh, there's downloads. So if you're trying to integrate into a control system and you needed to get an example project, you can download it from the web there. Uh, we also have a lot of YouTube videos out there. Uh, we have two YouTube channels. There's one called Think Siemens, and then there's one, one called the Siemens Knowledge Hub. And we have videos on the installation, step-by-step -step through the installation. We have videos on configuration. We have videos for calibration, and we have quite a few troubleshooting videos out there as well. Um, so we have uh, very different sources of support that we can give you, and uh, but they're pretty well supported. So now we'll talk about some different applications. Now this is one of my favorite applications and it's my favorite application for a couple of reasons. But first of all, I like it because it has a very fast ROI. Um, we've done this in a lot of different industries. We've done this with grain as we're doing here. Uh, we've done it with roofing granules, fertilizers, uh, of course, aggregates, plastic pellets. We've even done this with municipal sludge. So the challenge with this application is typical practice when loading trucks and rail cars is to load them to 90% of their capacity. And the reason they do that is because they don't want to risk overfill and they're not weighing the material as it goes into the truck or the rail car. They'll load it up to what they think is about 90%. They take it out to the edge of the plant where there's a truck or a track scale. They'll weigh it to get a shipping weight. And as long as it's not overweight, they ship it. The challenge with this, though, is, is they're wasting 10% of their shipping capacity. I, I had a grain handler out in Nevada, not this one. It was a different one. But they told me, yeah, effectively, every 10th rail car I ship is empty. So that, that has a significant impact on the shipping costs. This customer selected the MMI uh, because they wanted to certify it. They wanted end-up certification. And this allows them to fill to 99% of its capacity. So if you think about that, going back to the grain handler in Nevada's comment about every 10th car shipping that empty, now instead of every 10th car shipping empty, it's every hundredth car shipping empty. And he could even probably dial that in by another uh, at least half percent, I would think, if he's using an MMI. Um, the, I told you we had done this on municipal sludge uh, with that customer. He told me they were spending about $2 million a year to ship this municipal sludge uh, for disposal. Well, if you think about a 9% savings on a $2 million a year bill, uh, that's about $180,000 a year they were able to save by weighing the material as it went into, in that case, it was trucks, as it was going into the shipping trucks. Another added benefit with this application, this grain handler, uh, because they selected the MMI uh, that is end up certified, they no longer have to stop at the track scale as they go, as they leave the plant. So once the train is loaded, they can ship it. So it saves additional time there as well. This is another interesting application. Uh, this is an aggregate plant, um, and they wanted to optimize their crushing process. And it's kind of like I was talking about earlier. If the crusher is designed to be fed at 300 tons an hour, and you're feeding it at, say, 200 tons an hour, 
well, then you're wasting energy because you're having to run the crusher longer to produce the same amount of material. On the other hand, if you're running it at 350 tons an hour, you're running the risk of spilling material. Uh, you're also risking having to reprocess it because it's not gonna it's not gonna crush as efficiently when you're uh, over capacity like that. So they wanted to optimize that process. Now what the customer did was they selected the MSI in the BW500L and they installed 23 belt scales. They put one on the um, infeed conveyor to the crusher and one on the discharge conveyor of the crusher on each of their different crushers they had in the plant. They also put a couple on some of the different stockpiles to monitor those. Um, the interesting thing about this application to me was this customer um, worked through his local utility and most local utilities will have an energy conservation program and you can apply for, sometimes it's grants, sometimes it's energy credits, but you can apply for reimbursement for implementing projects if you can demonstrate you're gonna save a certain amount of energy. So this customer did the math on the amount of energy he would save by not having to reprocess and not having to run his crushers below capacity. And the energy company submitted, he did all the math and submitted all that to the energy company through their energy conservation special programs, I think what he said it was. And um, he submitted all the information before he purchased the scales. They approved it. He purchased the scales, and that significantly offset the the uh, the cost of the equipment. So they paid for a significant amount of the equipment in that. And most utilities will have programs like this. I went in and looked around, and I found them in a lot of different states. In fact, there are even uh, websites that will list all of the different utilities that have these programs and and how to contact those people. So this is a, an application. My next application is in a copper mine out in Arizona. Uh, similar to the previous customer, they wanted to optimize their primary crusher, but really more important, what they wanted to know was how much ore was the mine producing every day, because they wanted to use this as a KPI measurement for the mine. In other words, the mine should be able to produce this amount of ore uh, on every shift. This customer selected the MSI or the MMI with the BW500. And the reason they went MMI was because they wanted the additional accuracy since they were going to be using this as a KPI measurement. They installed the MMI on the discharge conveyor of the, of the primary crusher. So that's the crusher. Uh, when it comes out of the mine, it goes through the primary crusher. And the primary crusher will size it anywhere from a small boulder size down to about six inch. Um, so they uh, they measured the discharge of that. They can use that to adjust the throughput on the primary crusher to optimize it. But more importantly, like I say, they were able to gain a KPI measurement uh, for the the mine in how much ore is produced each day. Well, that's my presentation for today. I hope you found some useful information. Um, if you have any questions, please send them in now. Um, if you have questions after the presentation, you can reach out to Jim, your local, uh, or your local list and salesperson, um, or you can reach out to me directly. Also, I'm active on LinkedIn. So if you, uh, use LinkedIn, I'd encourage you to connect with me there. Um, uh, Jim, did we, do we have any questions coming in? You've done such a spectacular job, John. At this point, uh, no, we did not get any questions. Um, and uh, no one has reached out here in the last moment or so to ask me any as well. So again, the contact information is on the screen. You can talk to my, contact myself or John at the numbers uh, listed. And I guess with that being said, John, uh, we'll wrap it up. We want to thank you for your time and uh, your many years of knowledge and expertise. So thank you for attending. Thank you for presenting. Have a wonderful day to everyone. Thanks, everyone.